We are recording. Okay. Okay. So thank you, thank you for having me. Um, the paper is co-authored with Juan, who's also in attendance. I've just checked, so he's here. If in case I'm saying something wrong, he can correct me. Paper is called "Optimal Object Assignment Mechanisms with Imperfect Type Verification." And the problem that we consider is the following: so we have an, an object. What we're calling an object assignment problem is a problem where you have objects that you need to assign to agents. In particular, in our setting, you're going to have objects that are that either have high quality or low quality, and you have agents who want these objects. But the problem is that you have more objects, more high quality objects than, than agents, and each agent can only be assigned at most one object. So we need to make choices here in terms of who gets the high quality objects. We're going to assume that agents have an independent private type and that the social planner prefers to reward the agents with the uh, higher type. So types are just the thing that the agent, that the, that the social planner wants to and the difference here between what is typically done in mechanism design and what we do is that um, the incentives are being are going to be given through not through transfers as is, as is standard or more standard, but rather through um, imperfect type verification. So this might sound a bit sort of an introduction, <laughs> like it's a, it's a bit, it's supposed to be a generic introduction to the theme, but I'm I'm guessing that the next slide is going to clarify it more. Basically. Um, I think there, there, are sort of, there are two ways to think about problems. So for the people that are more familiar with, uh, with mechanism design, maybe the, the one, the, the, the comparison is to think about an auction, where, but where you don't have transfer. So you're going to have agents who are going to have, so there's going to be goods that, 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 are, um, that you have to assign to people. And people will have valuations, if you want to think about it like that, about the objects that are being um, given out. So normally or narrowly, what you would do would be an auction in order to, to give the, the objects to the people who value the objects the most. But the main difference to, to, to what we do is that you know, we don't have transfers. And so if you don't have transfers, you can't, can't run an, you can't ask for money. So you can't run an auction. And so instead of that, in order for incentives to be given to the agents so that you don't assign randomly, um, we are assuming that the social planner can with uh, imperfectly can imperfectly verify the agents uh, types. So in, in the auction setting, it would be the agents valuations. So that's one way to think about it. Another way and, and uh, Another way to think about it is maybe to think about the applications that we're going to consider. And so one of the applications uh, is the college admissions problem. And so uh, this is something I didn't say in the beginning, but the, the, in our paper is sort of a mix between mechanism design and is one of the applications, well, several of the applications, some of the applications that we have are for matching uh, or, or are for the topics that have been studied by the matching literature. So we're, we're trying to look at it in a bit of a different way. And so, as I said, one of the examples that uh, fits into the setting that we are studying is the college admissions problem. So in that case, the objects that we're assigning are universities. In our setting, we're going to have good universities and not so good universities. Um, and then the social planner, what he wants to do is he wants to reward the more talented students. And talent here, talent is, is something that is not, doesn't have any meaning in and of itself. It's just what the social planner wants to reward. But the thing is, the talent is only observed by the students, or at least it's um, each student knows better about his own talent than everybody else. So, if the social planner, of course, if the social planner knew who was the most talented student, they would the social planner would reward those students the most with with the better objects, the better universities. But the but the problem is that they, the social planner doesn't know, and so in order to help the social planner distinguish who's who. He is going to be able to observe signals of talent, which could be the student's grades, so the, his GPA, his um, SAT, the PSU here in, in Chile, letters of recommendation, whatever, whatever that is. So the, the idea is how do we use the student's grades in order to um, in order to maximize welfare, which would be the, the, the payoff of the social plan. So other examples are this school assignment problem so that's similar to the college admissions problem there's the housing assignment problem that's that's when you have you have people who can't afford a house and then the social planner needs to decide who's going to get a house basically and and so you can't have transfers in that case because the point is that people can't pay for it and 
so there are others, other examples in the matching literature that also. Okay, so what is the, so that's the setting. What is the, what, what do we find as the optimal mechanism? And I'm gonna give you the optimal mechanism in terms of the, using the college admissions language. So the idea is that, and this is the main distinguishing feature between our mechanism and other, and other mechanisms that exist. Before doing their uh, SAT, their, their, before getting their final results, or actually doing their final exams, students are asked to select one of their various tracks, of many tracks. So basically, they're, they're asked to self-select into an option. Then once they select that, they're going to do their exams, the grades are going to come out, and depending on what the grades were and on the track they chose, they will be assigned to either the the better, one of the better schools, one of the not so good schools, or, or they will end up unassigned. And so each track that they might choose is composed of two thresholds. These are the these are thresholds over the grades of the exam, basically. And so if a student has a, a grade, so suppose that the, the, the student chose track T, if his grade is above this S upper bar T, then he gets assigned to one of the better schools. If it's in between the two thresholds, it gets assigned to one of the low quality schools. And if it's below the lower threshold, then it doesn't get assigned. So basically, this is something like this. Our optimal mechanism is something like this. But this is an example where you have three tracks, track one, which is this one, track two, and track three. And the S's are the, the grades that you, that you have in your exam. So before you know your grade, you pick one of, one of these three tracks. So notice that, and then once the grade comes out, so suppose that you pick, let's say that you pick the middle track. If your grade comes out above this S upper bar two, okay, so imagine that S upper bar two is, I don't know, five, and S upper bar, bar two is three. So if your grade is above five, you go to the top school. If your grade is between three and five, you go to the not so good school. If it's below three, you don't get placed. That's, that's, the, that's the logic. The agents are asked to basically to self-select before they know their grade, before they even do their exam, they're asked to self-select into one of the, in this example, into one of these three tracks. And this is actually, yeah, this is, a, yeah, yeah, I was, So uh, this is actually similar to something that is done in Hungary, where you, in that case you have two tracks, and basically the, the student can choose to do a harder test, uh, but if, you, if they do well in that harder test, they have more chances of getting to the better stuff. So it's somewhere, somewhat similar to what is done there. Okay, so that's the optimal mechanism. Why is it that this makes sense? In particular, why, so as I said, the, the, what is new here is the, this multiple track system. Why is it that uh, it makes sense for for students to, to have this option. So notice here that, that, I mean, I haven't said this, but when I talk about high quality schools and low quality schools and, and then no schools, it means that, that every student has the same preferences over what schools to go to. So in principle, um, if you think about the mo most of the mechanisms in, in uh, matching, they don't ask anything. In, in, that, in those circumstances, they wouldn't, they wouldn't ask anything to the students because the point in mechanisms uh, and the more standard mechanisms that I'm going to talk about later. Um, the point of asking students for anything is to ask them about their preferences, where they want to go. But here the preferences are known. So in principle, there would be no point to asking them uh, anything. Here, the logic then to ask them to self-select between the multiple tracks is the following. So if we go back to the picture, and if we have these three options, who would pick what type Everything else the same. What type of student would pick the the track on the left, and what type of student would pick the track on the right? The, the, what we argue is that the people who would pick the track on the right would be the people who are more talented. Who are because they are more talented, they are more confident that their grade is going to be basically that their grade is going to support their own view of of being talented. And so that's gonna that's gonna make them pick this track. Whereas people who are less talented, students who are less talented, because they're going to be more afraid that they're not going to be able to get into the, the, the yellow area, to, into the green areas, they're going to pick the track on the left. Because the track on the left, if you look at it, is safer. The track on the left, you're guaranteed to get into either the low school or the high, or the high school. You're, you're always getting placed, basically. Whereas the track on the right, 
there is more risk in the sense that it is easier to get into the better school because the threshold is lower, but you also have the substantial risk of, of not getting it. Okay, so the logic is, is, is that, basically. If you have tracks like these, uh, more skilled people are going to land into, are going to pick this, the less skilled people are going to pick this. But then what that's going to generate is that the, the bar, the threshold, into, uh, the threshold for getting into the better school is lower for higher types than it is for lower types. Okay, so it's like the, the, the social planner discriminates in favor of those that are more talented. But that is exactly the goal of the social planner here. So the social planner, as I stated in, in the first slide, the goal of the social planner is to reward more those who are talented and reward less those who are less talented. And so that's why, that's why this makes sense because Ideally, the social planner would want to just place all the talented people into the top school and all the less talented people into the other schools. Okay, and this is a way that he can try and do that. He can't do that directly because he can't observe the, the agent's types, but if he asks them to self-select, he can do that to, at least to some extent. Okay. Um, right. So that's, that's what I said. Uh, is, there, is there any question here before I move forward to the, to the literature? No, no, todavía, Francisco. Adelante. All right. Okay. So the, the, there are two sort of uh, literatures that are uh, relevant. So the first one is on mechanism design. There's this literature on mechanism design that studies it's, it's a mechanism design without transfer. So they're looking at how to assign homogeneous objects to agents with this assumption that there's perfect time verification. So in, in particular, the assumption is that either there is a cost to so let me, right, the assumption that almost all of them make is that there is a cost to verifying, so you can't verify everyone, right? Otherwise you would, you just verify everyone. Um, the other alternative would be, so the Mimovanov paper, instead of assuming that there's a cost, assumes that it is impossible to completely destroy objects. Um, so we don't have this assumption. In our case, you, there is no cost to verifying, and it is possible to completely destroy all objects. But we are different in that our verification is imperfect rather than if our Francisco yeah. te tengo, eh, Adriana te quiere hacer una, una pregunta. Okay. La, um, Adriana, adelante, por favor. ¿Me escuchan? Adriana. Sí, ahora te escuchamos, dale. Okay. Eh... Volviendo a la slide donde tenías las tres posibles tracks para que los estudiantes se autoseleccionen. ¿Esa autoselección no estaría también influenciada por el costo que puede tener para un estudiante que queda fuera, tener que esperar al año siguiente para volver a dar el examen? No sé si han planteado este modelo con la posibilidad de repetir el juego el próximo año. Right, so, so our statement is that all else the same, more talented students will pick the track on the right and less talented students are going to pick the track on the left. Now, of course, if there's other problems, like if agents have other things that we're not, other properties that we're not considering, then then, um, then it would be different. So in, in our case, we don't consider outside options, which I, I think that's what you were mentioning. So if you get into the red, into the if you get into the red part, you get a payoff of zero. Uh, I'll show you that that is the case. Um, uh, so yeah, so so that is what's going on. The other, the other, the other thing, the other thing that uh, sometimes people ask me in this part part is about risk aversion, and it's related to what you're asking. So in our case, we also assume that everyone has the same level of risk aversion. Of course, if agents have different levels of risk aversion, then you could have more talented people who are um, very risk averse picking the track number one, and and you could have less talented people being uh, very risk loving that would pick track uh, number three, so that could also happen. That's why we say that, that, that uh, everything else the same, uh, that uh, this would be what would happen. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I can go back to the, if there's no more questions about risk conversion, I can go back to it towards the end. Um, as I said, that, that's a question that we sometimes get, so. Okay. Um, all right, so the, this mechanism design literature, 
we don't, as I said, we, we have imperfect type verification, but we don't have this assumption. So we assume that there is no cost to verifying or it is po and it is possible to completely destroy all objects. And so in our version of the game, if we did, or, or rather no, in their version of the, of the mechanism, if we have perfect type verification and we did not have the assumption, we could actually have a first test mechanism, which would be you ask agents to report their types, and then you verify only the largest ones because there's no cost uh, if we get rid of the assumption. If those reports are truthful, you give those people the objects. If not, you destroy all objects. Okay, and this gives incentives for everyone to report truthfully, and you, you get the first best, which is to give the objects to the better types. Of course, if the, the verification is imperfect, as is the case with us, this doesn't work anymore because now the lowest type would not be getting the good um, under this first best mechanism ever, would prefer to lie and say that they have a, a high uh, type and they wouldn't be caught with some probability. So they would be caught with some probability, but they would get away with it with some probability. And so that's this first best mechanism wouldn't work. Now you could think that, the bit, well, then the, the best mechanism, the second best mechanism would be rather than use types, you could use the agent's signal. So you replace everywhere by, by signals rather than types. That's actually a one-track mechanism where you're just looking at the signals and deciding who gets the good, and in our case, who gets what good as a function of the signals. But as I've just explained, one-track mechanisms in general are not going to be that. We want to have multiple tracks. Okay, so our, what we do also contributes to showing that if you have heterogeneous objects with imperfect type verification, that you can't just apply the same mechanism as you can apply in this way. In matching, um, there's, there's, I'm sure you know, there's many people who have looked at the similar problem, that, that the college admissions problem. Uh, their focus of these and other people, many other people, is um, to characterize mechanisms that have certain, certain properties. And here we have just a few. So incentive compatibility is also a property that we care about. And then they all, they, these, the, this literature also cares about efficiency and what's called elimination of justified envy. Justified envy exists when someone with a better grade, a better score, would prefer, have, is envious of some of someone with a lower score. So he, the person with a, with a higher score would prefer to have to be assigned the university that the lower score had. And so typically these these papers don't like justified when they eliminate justified. Um, now. We get different results. So the mechan the optimal mechanism, as I said, is not the, the mechanisms, it's not a mechanism that has been discussed before, as far as we know. And the main reason for that is that there is an implicit assumption in these papers that we sort of break, which is this notion that grades and talent are perfectly correlated. If you, if you read this, this literature, there's basically never a distinction between what are grades and what are talent. And we make that distinction uh, explicit, right? We say that talent and grades are not, they're correlated, but not perfect. Perfectly correlated. So, if grades and talent were correlated, uh, then the deferred algorithm, the Gale Shapley algorithm, would actually be optimal in our model. It would be very simple. It's just you go to the to the people with the better grades. You give you you send those to the better better school. The second better grades go to the second better school, and so on. And that would be the deferred algorithm in our in our setting because preferences are commonly known and, and common for everyone. But because so, and, and that mechanism, uh, okay, one thing at a time. First, under this assumption that the EA mechanism would be optimal, moreover, even, even with the assumption that grades and talent are, imper are, are, are imperfectly correlated, the DA algorithm would be a, one sim a simple one-track system that ranks people or that assigns people based exclusively on their grades. It's incentive compatible because there's just one track. It is efficient and eliminates justified envy. So it seems to have all the properties that, uh, that uh, people in general care about, but we show that when there is imperfect correlation, this optimal mechanism, the DA mechanism will not be optimal because the optimal mechanism has many traits. Furthermore, the optimal mechanism might not be efficient and it certainly does not eliminate uh, justified envy. And the justified envy part is easy to see. We can see it already if we go back to the, to the picture. Imagine that uh, that uh, a low type picks track one and then has a grade over there, slightly below S upper bar one. 
And then a high type picks track three and has a grade slightly above S of bar three, but lower than what the, the other person have when they pick track one. In that case, the person who picked track one will have a higher score than the person who picked track three. So they would be envious. Um, and we allow for that. So, so the optimal mechanism is such that that person would be envious of someone who has a more. Okay, so in, our point then being that uh, the, the focus on efficiency and the elimination of justified envy may, may come in the way of, uh, of uh, welfare, of maximizing the, the social planners. Okay, um, I'm going to proceed to the model if there are no questions. Um, so the model, we have a continuum of agents of mass one, and then we have two types of objects, a high quality object and a low quality object with measures alpha high and alpha low. So we allow for two cases, basically there's, it, it might be that alpha high plus alpha low is smaller than one, in which case there's no enough, not enough objects for everyone. It could also be that the sum of the two is bigger than one, in which case there are enough objects for everyone. However, we all, we never have enough high quality objects for the agents have a each agent has a private type theta. Uh, the larger the index, the larger is theta, and Q is the prior. Each agent generates a signal. Okay, so this would be the grade of the agent in the in the college admissions case, and the signal is correlated only with his own type. The conditional density is this p function, and and we assume the we have this mountain migration problem, which basically says that the larger Type I am the larger grade I'm likely to get. If I'm a larger type, I'm more likely to get better grades, better signals. Okay, the payoffs are this is just notation, so it's u of theta high if you're assigned a high object, u of theta low if you're assigned a low object, and zero if you're not assigned any object. Okay, so this this is what I was saying before. If you have if you wanted to have some type of um, outside options, then you'd have to have something different here on the zero that would depend on your type. Presumably, if you wanted to have it, at least if you wanted to have it correlated, if you wanted to have your outside option correlated with your type, and, and the results would follow provided that whatever I put here, provided this thing minus whatever I put here is increasing with theta. Um, in fact, let's go through the assumptions then. The first assumption is that each agent has the same or no preferences over options. So everyone agrees on what the best schools are. First, the best school is the high school, then the low school, then low school. Then I'm actually going to skip into into this into the second uh, into the third bullet point. It says that agents, types, and objects qualities are complex. So basically, it's the it, going from zero to going from no school to the L school is increasing with my type, and going from the L school to the high school is also increasing with my type. Okay, so this is this is here because we want the social the social planner will care expected utility of a an, an, um, representative agent, if you want. The expected utility, the exam, the expected utility of the agents were symmetric uh, in our case. And so in order for him, for the social planner, to want to assign those who are more talented to the better schools, we need to have something in the utility functions and the payoffs that gives us, give us that. And this is what we have. So <clears throat> because because the, the, the higher types value more going up the scale, basically, that is what makes the social planner more interested in rewarding the, the high schools. Bullet point number two says that this ratio is weakly increasing. So this is the ratio between the, the payoff that I get if I have the high school and the payoff that I get the, the, the low school. But what it means is that high types value weakly more the high object relative to the L object. I would emphasize that this only needs to be weakly increasing, so it could be constant, for example. I'm going to postpone, if, if you allow me, I'm going to postpone the reason, the, the discussion on why we need this um, to the next slide. Okay, and when I'm connecting it with the mechanism design literature. But one example that you can use is the, to have in your mind is this. So your, your utility would be theta times high. If, if it's high, theta times low if it's low, with high bigger, bigger than low. And in that case, this uh, ratio would actually be, actually be positive. Okay. Uh, now some definitions before we... we Show you the result. An allocation is instead of compatible if, and uh, basically you need to want to report your type over reporting something else. And I would emphasize here that uh, you're reporting your so you're reporting your type, your theta, and you're reporting before 
you do your exam, before you observe the realization of the signal. And in fact, that is how incentives are being given. Okay. So the, the idea here, because you don't have transfers, you need to have some way to distinguish between the different types. The way is different types have different beliefs with respect to the signal that is going to come out. But if you, if you, as I was, I was showing you before, those three tracks, what's going to happen is that different types will have different beliefs about whether, where they're going to land in each, in each track. And so that's why they might have different preferences with respect to the different tracks. So that's what uh, an incentive compatible allocation is. And then an allocation is ordered. I'm going to, I'm going to show you directly with the picture. So an allocation is ordered if it looks something like this. Francisco, voy a, eh, hay una pregunta de, de Juan Pablo. Yeah. Déjame, déjame, eh, me, per, me perdí en este momento. Acá, eh, Juan Pablo, ahora sí. Juan Pablo, adelante. Ahora sí, me escucha. Sí, ahora te escuchamos. ¿Me escuchan? Hey. Hola, hola Francisco, ¿qué tal? Solo una duda sobre tus hipótesis de monotonía en las utilidades. Eh, eso me huele a, a supermodularidad. Una cosa técnica, ¿qué están buscando ahí? ¿Quieren, ¿Quieren monotonía en la solución en relación al tipo? ¿En, en, la, en el punto 2 o en el punto 3? En el 3. No, en el 3 es, es lo, que, lo que estaba explicando. O sea, la idea, yo te voy a mostrar, voy a show you the, the welfare function. So the welfare, uh -huh. in fact, I can show you now. Uh, The welfare function is going to be this. So you're just wanting to maximize the expected utility of the of the agent, the exact okay. expected utility of the agent. And so what I want this to reflect is I want the, the social the W to want to maximize to maximize the, the the rewards of the higher types and not the lower types. So I need to have some me mechanism or some not mechanism, some uh, assumption that tells me that the social planner wants to reward more the high types over the lower. And that is what I'm getting with the with assumption number three. Okay. Because it says that if you go from zero to L, the, the higher types benefit more. And if you go from L to high, the high types benefit more. Okay. Thank you. Gracias, Juan Pablo. Um, entonces, uh, yeah, well, I was talking about ordered allocation. So what, what is an ordered allocation? This is important for what comes next because the optimal mechanism or the optimal allocation is an ordered allocation. There are two properties with ordered allocations. The first one, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I got lost here a bit. Did I talk about this? I think I skipped that part. Did I not? Okay, so let me let me go back because I think I skipped this slide. <laughs> a symmetric allocation. I just went straight to to incentive compatibility. No, a symmetric allocation is a mapping from the agents' types and from their um, signal into uh, an X high and X low, basically. So the idea is you tell me your type and, you, and then I'll go and check your signal, your grade. And as a function of that, you'll be placed in the high school with probability X high and you'll be placed in the low school with probability X low. Okay, and the sum of the two probabilities has to be smart. And so the, the, here is where the assumption that we have a continuum of agents actually kicks in because if we have N agents as, as, as a standard in matching, This would be a big problem because then an allocation would be a function of my reports, of everyone else's reports, and of my signal and then everyone else's signal. Okay, so it would become possible. Well, I don't know if it's possible, but, it, but very hard to, to deal with when we're doing mechanism design. By assuming that we have a continuum and then we focus on symmetric allocations, that uh, makes matters much simpler. So basically, when we say we have a continuum, we're essentially saying that there's no uncertainty with respect to uh, the distribution of, of types. Right, so we know essentially we know every the proportion of every type and every signal for each type. What we the uncertainty that we keep is that each person individually does not know what signal they're going to get. So they're afraid that the signal that they might get, the grade that they might get, does not represent or reflect accurately their uh, talent. Okay, and then allocation. So that's x high and x low are those are the probability you assign to each school. And then allocation is feasible if, and this is the proportion of people who are assigned to the high school, that has to be smaller than the space we have in the high school, and the same thing goes for the both. So sorry, I don't know why I skipped that. Uh, that's, that's why. This is obviously very important. <laughs> okay, so that's what an allocation is. And now, of course, now we say what an allocation, what, what it means for the allocation to be incentive compatible. So it just means that you want to report truthfully. 
you want to report your time truthfully. And as I said before, you um, choose what to report before knowing the city. You know your type, but you don't know the city. Okay, and now we go to the order of allocation. So in order of allocation, let's look at the picture here. I think it's more explanatory. So there are two part, two properties of these of the of order of allocations. The first one is that suppose that I know your your type and that I know your six. So let's say let's say that I know that you're type one, and let's say that I know that your grade was here. Okay, 0 0.9, let's say. Then you're you either get placed into the high school, the low school, or no school. That is, there is no random, there is no extra randomness, basically. If I know your fate and I know your S, I know exactly what school you're going to. Okay, so that's property number one. Property number two is that all rewards are at the top. So if you have, regardless of your type, if you have a high grade, you're going to go to the green part. So you're going to go to the best school. Uh, if you land in, it, it, then then if you're in the middle, you go to the low school, and that's the yellow part. And then if you're below, you have a, a bad grade, you're going to go to the low school. So you have these thresholds that uh, define what an order of allocation is. And this particular order allocation is not incentive compatible because type one would prefer to go to would prefer to report to be in type two, right? Because there's just more green and more yellow. So this yellow becomes green and this red becomes yellow. So he would be better off saying that he's type two. And welfare, as I've shown you before, is just the, the, the expected utility of the allocations. And we say that it's optimal if it maximizes the allocation. Okay. Um, any questions on the model part? I have about 30 minutes, right? Eh, sí, aproximadamente un poquito menos, sí. Yo tengo una, una, una pregunta, Francisco, relacionada con el rol, que no lo haces explícito, de la versión en riesgo. ¿Hay sí. algún rol particular en el, en el modelo ahí? The agents could be risk averse. There's nothing preventing, so this is the utility and this is, and sorry, and this is the assumptions. So nothing in here prevents the agent to, from being risk averse. What we're assuming is that they're all risk averse. So either they're all risk averse or none of them, they have the same risk aversion level, basically. The only thing that distinguishes how they value the schools is the theta. Uh -huh. And so that's why they could be risk averse. Now, the problem that we have, and, and so maybe I can discuss that right now. The problem that one might have, I think, is, so what is the concern? The, the, the system makes all else the same. The more risk-loving people are going to go to the best schools because they're, they're going to risk it. So if we go back to the issue. Uh, if we go back to this picture, the, all else the same, the most risk-loving people are going to go to track three. If your uh, risk aversion coefficient, let's say, is sort of independent of everything else, so each person has its own uh, risk aversion level and that is independent and uncorrelated with anything else, then we don't see that as a particular problem. At least, I don't want to talk for one, but I don't see it as a particular problem. A problem would exist if risk aversion is correlated with something that we care about. So one of the examples or the example that we discussed in the paper is let's say that the richer people are more risk loving than poor people. Then our mechanism would be in a way contributing to um, further income inequality in the sense in the sense that the, 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 there would be, the, the rich people would be concentrated both in the top school and also in no school. How do we deal with that? Well, if if this is known, that is, if on the one hand you know who's rich and who's poor, and on the other hand, if the risk aversion coefficients of all the rich people is sort of more or less the same between them, and the coefficient of risk aversion of the poor people is also more or less the same among them, we can just discriminate in the mechanism. That is, we can treat a rich person and a poor person uh, differently. So it, essentially, we would treat it as two different mechanisms. And so the rich people would face some some lotteries and some probabilities, and and the poor people would face different lotteries and different and different probabilities. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me let me then show you the main result and give you some of, a bit of just a little bit of intuition on the result rather than go through the proof. So the theorem is it's just repeating what we say. So maybe looking at that doesn't help. Uh, wait, hold on, sorry. <laughs> let me go here. The optimal mechanism looks like this if you have three three types. Okay, so basically you have number one, you have an ordered allocation, and so each type is going to have like thresholds basically, right? So these are the the allocation. This is how type one, type two, and type three would be assigned. 
the upper upper threshold is going down. Okay, so basically the green space is increasing as you increase the pipe. The bottom threshold is going up. Okay, so the red space is also increasing. And then the other property that is just important for the proof basically is that each type is indifferent to the type above. So type one is indifferent to mimicking type two. Type two is indifferent to mimicking type three. And if there was a type four, type three would be indifferent to type four. So, okay, so this is how the optimal allocation looks like. How do we how do we argue? How do we how do we show that this is the case? And uh, let me just take five minutes just to show you the problem that we have and how the technical problem we have and how we solve it. And connecting it a bit with the, the, the mechanism design literature. So we can think of our problem as having two uh, two goods. The probability of being assigned a high object and the probability of being assigned a low object. And so with that in mind, we can write down the interim payoff, the expected interim payoff of a given agent of type theta, which would be something like right now you could divide this whole thing by u of theta l and this would look very similar to the Meyerson setup when you have options for example okay so the first thing would be the probability that you get the the object that is being auctioned and then the second good would be money would be transfers okay and so when you have that how do we solve it in Meyerson we have this single crossing assumption which says basically that higher types always value the first object more than lower types, okay? And in our setting, that, that would actually be guaranteed if we were to assume that this ratio was increasing, strictly increasing with theta, okay? Now, we assume that this is weakly increasing with theta because uh, essentially we don't want that effect to kill our effect that I'm going to describe to you in a second. But as I said before, this can be constant. And if it's constant, then every agent values these two objects in the same. But again, if we were in, in, in Meyerson, the way that you would do it would be, okay, this is strictly increasing, therefore agents value the first object more. And that gives me, if I have this type of single crossing, that tells me that when I have my optimal allocation, types that are close by are also going to be assigned lotteries that are, that are similar, okay? And that helps a lot in, because you, if you have that, you can look only at the local incentive constraints rather than the whole set of incentive constraints. With us, the problem is different. And it's different because these probabilities, the probability of receiving the high object and the probability of receiving the L object, don't depend only on what you report, but also on your type. So in Meyerson, the probability that you get the object in, in an auction is just, just depends on what you report, on what you bid, essentially. With us, it depends not only on what you report, but also on your actual type, because your actual type determines the probability that each signal is drawn, right? And the object, when you get, you, probability you get the object depends on, on that signal. So that's why the two problems are, are fundamentally different, because these probabilities depend on your type. And therefore, we have this, this the problem that we have is this, is basically that you have, that you can have incentive compatible allocations where types that are far apart get some, that get lotteries, get goods, lotteries of goods that are very similar, and type, yeah, so types that are far apart get, get similar things, more similar than those that are close. So in the example, let's look at this example. This is this could be incentive compatible because type one, remember, type one prefer or, or is more likely to end low signals. Type type three is more likely to have high signals. So this could be incentive compatible. And it could also be that type one and type three have the same, essentially, the same probability of, of getting the high quality object and the same probability of getting the low quality object. So types one and three are getting essentially the same thing. And type two is getting something very different. But type two is the one that is closer to type one, not type three, okay? So in general, if you look at this problem as is, in general, you'd have to look at all the incentive constraints, which would be, you know, a mess. You can't, you can't do mechanism design in general like that. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we first realized that when we have ordered allocations, and if we have ordered allocations, the two goods just become the two thresholds, when we have ordered allocations, we actually have um, single crossing in the sense that if you calculate the interim utility of uh, each agent, of each type, with respect to S upper bar and S lower bar, you actually see that uh, they only cross once, that's single crossing. And so that means that if you have, if you just look at ordered allocations, the only thing that you need to care about are local incentive constraints. Essentially, types that are close together are gonna have uh, 
thresholds that are close together. That's that's uh, what single crossing is going to give us in the order of allocations uh, setup. But of course, we don't know if the optimal by this at this point we don't know if if order allocations are optimal or not. So how do we then complete the argument? We take the original problem, which is to maximize our welfare subject to the feasibility constraints, and then the incentive. These are incentive constraints going up, upward incentive constraints. Basically, no type wants to, to report to being a larger type. And then these are incentive constraints going down, meaning no type wants to pretend to be a type that is lower than what he is. But instead of solving this whole problem, we just solve a relaxed problem where we only have one and two. Okay, so the only from now on until the end of the argument, we only care about the constraint instead of constraints going up. No type can pretend to be a type higher, but they could pretend to be a type lower. And if we look only at that relaxed problem, we have this result, which ends up being the key result of the whole thing. It says, suppose that you have an allocation that satisfies all the incentive of the, all the all the constraints of the relaxed problem. That is the feasibility constraints and the upward constraints. We can construct an ordered allocation that satisfies the same constraints. Okay, so this basically says that ordered allocations resolve solve the the, the relaxed problem. And the way that we're building the order allocation is just, uh, well, I'm going to show you. How do we build the, the order allocation? Suppose that you have some arbitrary allocation that solves your upward incentive constraints and your feasibility constraints. And it looks something like this. What you're going to do is you're going to put the green at the top, the yellow in the middle, and the red at the bottom in all three. So you're going to do this. Okay, And then we're going to argue that all the, everything is going to be fine. So. When you do this, you keep the purport, all proportions keep, are kept the same. That is, the type one is still going to the top school with the same probability as before. It's just that he, he only goes to it now when he has the better, the, the good, the good signals. He, and he still goes to the yellow, to the yellow school with the same proportion as before. And, it, and the red is, is also the same proportion as before. You're just moving them around in the, in each track. So the welfare for the, for the social planner is the same. The, um, feasibility is also guaranteed by definition. The only thing we need to make sure of is that no type wants to mimic a type um, above. Well, let's see why that is. So take type one. His expected utility stays the same as before because I've just reordered where, for what signals he goes to, to each school, but I didn't change the overall probabilities of going to each school. So he's thinking whether he should move to, to he should mimic type two or not. Before, when he had this, he didn't want to mimic, right? By definition, we're saying that the allocation was incentive, was, was satisfied the upward incentive constraints. So he didn't want to do it before. Now, the new version of, of, this, of this track gives type two the same probabilities. It's just that the rewards are at the top. When we do that, we actually decrease the incentives of type one from mimic. Because basically type one now, when he looks at type two, sees that the rewards are at the top, but type one is less likely to get reward, the, the top rewards than type two. So this change that left type two indifferent actually made type one um, better off should he choose to mimic. All right, so that's that. And then the, 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 the proof is completed by saying that, okay, so the ordered, the optimal relaxed allocation or unoptimal relaxed allocation is ordered. So let's, now that order, now we know that ordered allocations have this single crossing property, and so they're all close together, we can only, we can look at them, we can find the optimal ordered allocation simply by looking at local incentive constraints, which is a much easier problem. And then finally, we check that the op optimal ordered allocation satisfies the lower incentive constraints, which it does, and that's it. And then we end up with the allocation that we have to begin with. Okay. Well, I hope that made sense. <laughs> so that was the argument for the optimal allocation. In the time I have left, I wanted to talk a little bit about the about college admissions. All right, so we have a few results that uh, we find interesting in this in this setup. So number one is about the DA mechanism. So as I mentioned before, the DA mechanism is the deferred algorithm, the, the, the Gill Shapley. So in our in our setting. It's seeing as every agent has the same preferences, it works very simply. It's just a one track mechanism where you go and the people with the better grades, they go to the best school. The second better grades go to the yellow school. 
the worst people, the worst grades, rather go to the red. Okay, so it's something like this. The allocation will be something like this when you only have two times. And we show that this is not optimal. It's never optimal if the if we don't have space for everyone. And uh, I think I'm going to skip the second part because I'm not sure if I have to. So I'm just going to talk about the first one. Okay, so imagine, imagine that uh, that uh, there is no space for everyone. Okay. Let me hold on. I do. Uh, okay, I'm not going to show this, but I'm going to state it because I'm going to need it. Um, so we're saying that the DA allocation is never optimal. Okay. So keep that in mind. Even when we have more more space than, than but I'm just going to show you the first part. Suppose you have something like this, okay? So the DA mechanism would be what is here with this red space for the people that. Uh, so we're we're basically both schools are at capacity, and then you just have don't have space for these people. At all. Here's what you could do to make it better. The, the, what the social plan would like to do would be to increase this threshold and lower this threshold. Right, because that would shift low types. It would shift low. No, it would replace low types. Um, replace low types to replace by by yeah. You replace low types by high types in the top school. So in the top school, you have more high types than low types. If you just do uh, this change here in in thresholds, which would be something that the social player would like to do because he wants to reward the high types more. Of course, if you do just this, if you just do this, then the, the low type would want to mimic the high type. So you need to then readjust these thresholds. And, and basically what you're doing is you're guaranteeing that number one, the proportions of, of people in either school stays the same. And then you're also guaranteeing that type one is still indifferent to type two, okay? And this is actually beneficial for the social plan because as I said, you're just changing the composition of the schools. Everyone is, a, so the, 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 both schools are still at capacity. You're just changing the composition of the schools and you're making sure that in the top school you have more high types. And once you have that, then, then you're doing better uh, according to the social planners. Okay. So there's that. Um, all right, in case two, you do the same thing, but now you don't have the bottom part, so it's a bit tricky. Okay, so that's number one. DA is never optimal uh, in general. Now. When is the DA optimal? Well, it will be optimal if the objects have the same goal. So in order to recreate a setting where objects have the same quality in, in our model, we're gonna look at what we call full allocations. And we are open to, to suggestions on other names for the type of allocations we're calling for, because I'm not sure if this is a good one. Anyway, a full allocation is an allocation such that every agent is assigned to a school. Okay, so obviously it requires that the the, the capacity, the sum of the capacities exceeds one. Okay. So basically, in a full allocation, if I was to draw you a picture, there would be no red spaces. It's either yellow or green. Okay. And in, so in that scenario, you either, if, if you're only looking at full allocations, you either get the top school or you get the low school. Right. So you can think of, of getting assigned to the top school as getting assigned the object and getting assigned to the low school as not getting assigned. Right. It becomes a homogeneous good problem. And in that sense, it becomes very similar to the mechanism design literature that I was telling you before, except that now we have imperfect evidence over and they have perfect evidence. And we find that in that case, the DA mechanism is optimal. Among all of the full instead of compatible allocations, the, 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 the DA mechanism is, is optimal. And the idea there is we do the same as, as we did when we showed the, the when we, we proved the main result. So we consider the relaxed problem where we only looking at constraints going up instead of constraints going up. And then we put all the rewards at the top as before. So we're only looking at ordered allocations. And we would, if we're looking for the optimal mechanism, we would end up always with uh, allocations that look like this. Okay, so these are ordered allocations that are full and that satisfy the upward incentive constraint. Of course, this is not going to be optimal for the, for the it's not going to solve the, re, the relaxed problem. Because again, remember that the high, that the, that the social planner wants to reward more high types over low types. So the high type, the, the social planner could come here and increase this threshold, lower this threshold until the two are the same, and be better. He would basically would replace low types in the top school and get more high types in the top school. So 
essentially you end, you're going to end up with something like this, where all the three, in this case, the three, the three types get the same exact uh, thresholds. But that's just DA. That's what the DA mechanism is. Right? So the DA mechanism is optimal when objects have the same quality. If objects don't have the same quality, it's not. Okay, justified NV we talked about before, so I've already shown you why why the optimal allocation is, does not eliminate justified NV. Let me let me skip to the part about uh, efficiency, which is I think, more interesting. Okay, so first of all, what 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 does efficiency mean in our setting? Basically, remember that every agent has the same preferences. So in order to guarantee efficiency, we just need to make sure that number one, the best school is always full because remember that we don't have. The, 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 the capacity of, of school one of the best school is smaller than one. So the best school has to be at capacity. And then either the second school is at capacity. Okay, so either both schools are at capacity, or if the second school is not at capacity, every student must be assigned. And what we find is that um, it might not be optimal. It might not be, sorry, the optimal mechanism might not be efficient. In particular, there is this threshold. Uh, alpha upper bar L, such that if the actual capacity of the low school is smaller than that threshold, then yes, then the optimal allocation will be non-wasteful and therefore efficient. If it is above that threshold, if the capacity of the low school is above that threshold, then the optimal allocation will be wasteful. So it will not be And the reason is, I mean, so I want to skip the that proof, but I'm going to go back to something that I didn't want to explain, but I want to explain now. So, <laughs> imagine that. So th look at this example. This is an example. Let's say that this is a this is an example of a efficient of an efficient uh, allocation. Okay. So the green part says, let's say that all this green is all the green that is available, in the so all the space that is available in the top school, and then the yellow is the part that is assigned to the low school. Okay. And so this would be the 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 a full allocation. And we know that the optimal full allocation is the DA mechanism. So it would actually be this. This would be the optimal full allocation. Okay, well, it will look, look like this. So why is it that this is not optimal? Basically, because I can do the same trick as before. I can raise this and lower that. And this makes the social planner better off. But now, if I just do this, that one would want to mimic type 2. So in order to prevent them from mimicking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise this bottom threshold a little bit, enough to make type 1 indifferent to mimicking type 2. And I'm going to have an assumption that says this, that says basically that this increase here is small for type 2. Okay, so the fact that type 2 now is unassigned with some probability is going to affect them very little. Basically, the probability is going to get unassigned is going to be very small. But the probability that type 1 would be unassigned should he mimic would be very large. Okay, so that's this assumption here. P0 given theta 1 is bigger than P0 given theta 2. Okay, and so if we do that, this change that we're doing, at least when these arrows are sufficiently small, would actually be uh, to the DA mechanism. Mechanism, which is the optimal full allocation, the optimal in, in, in the optimal efficient allocation, moreover, um, then it means that the optimal um, that, that the optimal allocation is not is not efficient because, as I said, now you have a red space here, even though you have space red. Okay. Uh, last point before we conclude. Yeah, last point. It's about binary mechanisms. So. One of the criticisms that you might have about our about our mechanism is that it might be too complicated. So basically, you can have as many tracks as you have types. So if you have a million types, the optimal mechanism, presumably you could have a million tracks and that would be hard to implement. So in, in, at some point in the paper, we look at the special case of when we, we only allow for two tracks. Okay, your mechanism can only have two tracks. And we ask the question whether Still, with two tracks, can we do better than just the one track with just the, the deferred algorithm? Should we better than this? And we show that that is indeed the case. And with, with the same conditions as before, we show that uh, the binary mechanism is always strictly better than the DA mechanism. And so, in order to, for you to improve upon the DA mechanism, you don't need to do anything super complicated. Even with a simple binary allocation, that doesn't 
Okay. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to conclude. Well, I guess then I'll be available for questions. We can we can uh, we can discuss after you conclude, uh, Francisco. Okay. So just then the, the, the last final points that, that, that uh, I want to make. This is part of this is part of some of my of some of, of I guess my uh, research agenda in a way. This notion that uh, to see how we can use evidence in order to elicit private information. And so there's there's more literature on this. And I also have other papers on this. The idea here is that rather than depending on transfers to, to induce agents to report whatever it is that we want to report truthfully in this case, uh, we use the different beliefs that they may have about the signals that we generate. Then in the college admissions problem, we, we make a contribution in terms of, uh, of presenting a new mechanism, as far as we know, a mechanism that, uh, that at least in our setting does better than the standard mechanisms. And the main property that it has is that it requires agents to self-select, not to self-report their preferences per se, because those we already know in our in our setting, but to self-select as a way to to transmit information about their their private type. Furthermore, we find that the optimal mechanism does not eliminate justified entity and might not be its most efficient. And so, the focus on mechanisms that are justified that have that eliminate justified entity or that are its most efficient might be detrimental to to finding the optimal. Mechanism. One, one point that, uh, that we think is important as well is sometimes there's this discussion about um, about whether we should have a, a college admissions uh, system that is centralized or decentralized. Uh, well, whenever the optimal mechanism is not supposed to be efficient, as is in our case, really you can't do, you can't, it, centralized systems won't work. If, if in, in, our, in our setting, it might be that there are schools with space and students that are unassigned. But if you have a decentralized system, for sure the, the schools with space would contact the unassigned students and get them to attend their school. So in order for you to prevent that, you would need to have a centralized system. And in that sense, this might be seen as an argument in favor of, of centralized systems. Well, and, and risk aversion, I've discussed that already, so I don't need to it anymore unless you have questions. So that was it. Good, thank you, Francisco. Uh, I don't know if there is a um, set si preguntas de de alguno de los de los asistentes. Yo mientras tanto tengo una una pregunta, Francisco. ¿Qué es lo que podemos aprender de tu trabajo respecto al mundo real de las múltiples, digamos, postulaciones que dependen del costo de postulación, cierto? Uno lo ve, por ejemplo, en el caso de los postulantes a doctorado que eh, en el, a veces postulan a a 30, 50 universidades cuando la forma de postulación es suficientemente barata. Eh, y claro, en un sistema que es descentralizado, ¿no? Entonces, ¿hay algo que uno pueda aprender de tu trabajo en esa línea eh, cuando uno tiene esto, este tipo de, de situaciones? Yeah, I'm going to answer in English. <laughs> so, the, the, uh, what I would say, I mean, I don't know if one is, agrees or not, the paper isn't, um, it's a theoretical paper, so you can't just take it and apply it directly because it, you have several assumptions that are not real. What I think is makes, what, what I think is the, the main point is that there is value to asking students to self-select because once you ask students to self-select, their talent level, seeing as they're more informed about the talent level, you're going to get information by asking them to say, do you want this or do you want that? That's something that we don't uh, usually see in the systems that we have. At least it's not clear to me that we have that in the systems that we have uh, that we have currently. As as in, that's one one point. If we were trying to do this in a more applied way, I, what is crucial is to identify um, the differences between the agents. So the, 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 what, what you were mentioning before about the costs um, of application, for example, and those would be different for rich people and poor people. If you know, in principle, if you know the there's. It's key to know what is private and what is public. So if you know who are the poor people and the constraints that they're under, then you can tweak the model to make it different for those people. Okay? The problem that you might have is if those things are private and you can't, you, you have no, no if, you, if you don't have a clue about those constraints uh, that people have that might be different among themselves, then it's hard to, to, um, to get around that. Okay, thank you. Eh, hay una pregunta de Juan Pablo. Juan Pablo, te escuchamos. 
Sí. Eh, ¿Ustedes han pensado un poco en los efectos, sobre todo pensando en el caso particular de elección escolar o de universidades, como decía Jaime, ¿han pensado en externalidades como el efecto par? Porque pienso que las señales también podrían eh, afectar eh, lo que... El, o sea, mis señales podrían ser afectadas por las señales de los otros y eventualmente eso llevarme a escoger instituciones que yo valoro ex ante su calidad más por las señales de quien postula que por la calidad propiamente tal. La pregunta es mucho más general y evidentemente no, se sale un poquito del paper, pero es por mi curiosidad. ¿Es, ¿Es fácil intentar poner externalidades en este contexto de ese tipo entre señales o no? Tenemos que pensar. Yo, no, no, yo ahora estoy haciendo un otro proyecto eh, donde, donde hay correlación, pero no es fácil. <ríe> es más fácil, obviamente, cuando los señales son independientes que cuando son correlacionados. Yo estoy, ahora estoy trabajando en una otra cosa que no es de college admissions, con, que tiene un número finito de, de agentes ahí. Estoy intentando jugar un poco con la idea de saber cuál es el mecanismo cuando los agentes tienen, tienen uh, tipos uh, que están correlacionados. Porque ahí, tú cuando tienes eso, va a tener incentive constraints. O sea, lo, la, la, si tienen muchos agentes con, con tipos correlacionados, todo va a quedar, como todas las, las incertificaciones se van a meter unas en las otras. Bueno, me estoy explicando mal, pero básicamente es más complicado. <ríe> o sea, tenemos que pensar, yo, yo, a, mí, yo, a mí, en mi opinión, me parece que el paper como está ahora es como que una primera, un primer esfuerzo para mirar al, al problema y después a medida que vamos avanzando en nuestra investigación puede ser que seamos capaces de, de ver el caso de las externalidades. Yo creo que tal vez pueda ser más fácil con, con un continuo porque eso te limita, te, te disminuye mucho las, las incentive constraints, pero, pero eso, pero tenemos que ver. Sí. Pero la idea es que parte de la agenda va un poco en esa dirección, ¿no? Para ver el efecto par en, en el asunto escolar, ¿no? Al menos de mi parte, yo no sé si, si Juan está de acuerdo, pero... Ok, gracias. Muy bien. Bueno, muchas gracias, Francisco, por eh, tu presentación. Eh, Espero que te, te vaya bien ahí con el, con el paper, eh, en, la, en el duro proceso de publicación que siempre se nos viene por delante. ¿no? Así que te, te, te deseo lo mejor y muchas gracias por, eh, por visitarnos. Pues. Gracias. Gracias a todos los participantes también.